think you'll be uh, very impressed with um, the idea uh, that I got the best speaker possible for this. But just to mention what the program is going to be about, of course, you re read about that. But uh, at Oaks, as Greg said in his, his description, um, uh, are a genus of plants that have been more closely associated with humans than any other species, but <clears throat> probably. And uh, he's going to take a look at our beloved oaks through the lenses of culture, history, and ecology. And now I'd like to tell you a little about uh, uh, Greg himself and all his work with um, oaks. Uh, it's Greg Reiske. He's the executive director of the Kettle Moraine Land Trust, uh, headquartered in Elkhorn. And uh, he uh, was introduced to the ecology of the Midwest oak savanna through the Palos Restoration Project in Cook County, Illinois. Uh, and this was in the 1990s. And then he's contributed to the first oak uh, ecosystem recovery plan for the region, which stemmed from the Midwest Oak Savannah Conference organized by the EPA in 1992. And he's been a steward of many areas, the Bluff Savanna at Water Fall Glen Forest Preserve in DuPage County. And he's been a steward in natural areas in McHenry, Lake and Winnebago counties in Illinois, as well as in Walworth, Wisconsin. And he's a, been a, a regular lecturer on winter oak species for Loyola, Loyola University Retreat and Ecological Campus in Illinois, and also teaches classes at the Morton Arboretum, which some of you may have visited in Illinois. And now with the Land Trust, he's uh, overseeing restoration of four preserves and uh, two of our county parks and uh, two DNR properties that Did I all of a sudden get muted? How much have yeah. you heard? Oh, we missed the last couple words. Oh, really? How did that happen? I didn't touch anything. <laughs> These computers. <laughs> okay, well, I just said that he's been a featured speaker for Wild One chapter meetings in Northern Kane County, Rock River Valley, and our own Kettle Moraine chapter. A couple years ago, he talked about um, preserving natural areas through easements and actually purchasing properties as the land trusts do. So I hope you didn't miss too much more. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I didn't touch my computer, but there it is. Thank you very much. And now, Greg, I'll let you get started. Thank you for joining us and being willing to give this lecture. Well, thank you very much, Mariette. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And if everyone would give me just a, a quick moment, uh, I will share my screen uh, so I can call up the slides. All right. Can everyone see the slides? All right. Well, you're all muted, so uh, yes, you can't tell me. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. It's always a pleasure to speak uh, with my friends from uh, Wild Ones, uh, especially the Kettle Moraine chapter, near and dear to my heart. Also near and dear to me are our oak species. Um, Oaks are meaningful to me uh, and to our collective consciousness, I think. Um, oaks are important to us culturally, uh, they're important to us locally, uh, and they're important to me personally. So I'm delighted to be able to share what I appreciate about our oaks and welcome you to celebrate uh, our affiliation with the oaks. So the general outline of the presentation is that uh, we'll talk a little bit about what is it we know about our oaks, um, where they came from, uh, how they've di diversified, uh, that sort of thing. We'll take a look at uh, oaks and humans and the relationships between uh, our respective species. We'll talk a little bit about the ecological aspects of the oaks in the landscape and what that means to us. And finally, we'll do a little health assessment of uh, 
the oaks in our area, um, sort of a checkup. So here's a, a wonderful specimen of white oak, Quercus alba, uh, here in Makwanago. Uh, and it exhibits that open grown aspect that you see when an oak tree is able to live its life out in the open without direct competition from other uh, tree species. Uh, the net result is that the oak crown is broad, very wide, wider than it is tall, and that it also will exhibit this pattern of uh, broad branching, uh, long horizontal branches close to the ground. Uh, and this is what we typically uh, see as a savanna type oak uh, one that grew up without a great deal of competition. Um, on the other hand, a forest grown oak uh, will have a much more vertical structure. It may be tall and narrow, more columnar. And I've seen white oaks uh, exhibit that growth form just as readily as this. So the conditions under which an oak tree grows uh, may have a great deal of influence over the uh, shape and structure of the oak itself. So what do we know about oaks? What are the common characteristics? So what, are, what are the elements that all oaks have in common? Well, to begin with, there are a lot of oak species to consider. There are more than 400 species of oaks that occur throughout the world. And more than half of all oak species, I think it's some 60%, occur here in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, oaks are very common throughout the Americas. Important to note that oaks are wind pollinated. And you see in the photo uh, to the right, the, the catkins dangling down below the uh, emerging unfurling oak leaves in the spring. Um, the flowers are inconspicuous and the pollen is dispersed by the wind. Oaks do not rely on insects or animals to transport pollen from uh, one species or one specimen to another. Uh, the pollen is carried on the wind and there are ramifications of that we'll talk about. Most notably that this results in a great deal of hybridization. So oaks that are closely related, one species to another, may hybridize. Um, our local oaks are divided into two tribes, the, the white oak tribe and the red oak tribe. We'll talk a little bit about how that came to be. But those in one tribe may hybridize very freely with others from the same tribe. Another thing that oaks have in common is their fruit. Uh, these are nuts, which we call acorns. Uh, it comprises a, a nut uh, under a cap. And you see it illustrated there, the lower photo on the right. Important to note that acorns are dispersed by animals. All plants have seed dispersal uh, techniques and strategies. Uh, and here it's very important to note that it is animals that uh, bring acorns some distance from the parent tree. And that's how a, a, a population is able to expand its range. So oaks generally um, do not tolerate shade. They, um, they thrive where sunlight is abundant. And because of that, their habitat tends to be um, the kind of sites where high sunlight is maintained over time. So these are areas that may be, um, may be uh, subject to fire periodically or to um, grazing or other influences that contribute to the open aspect of the canopy, allowing an abundance of sunlight to reach the ground layer where the acorns um, become saplings. 
Now it's important to note that oaks are not fussy when it comes to soil type. Um, oaks uh, can grow in all sorts of soils. Now some may show a preference for um, certain hydrological patterns or uh, other soil elements, uh, but overall uh, they're tolerant of a wide range. So here you see um, a little bit of background about the subgroups uh, of oaks that appeared over evolutionary time. We're not going to get into a great deal of detail. This isn't a highly technical presentation, but suffice to say that those three groups that are shown in black type, uh, the leucobalanus, erythrobalanus, and protobalanus, uh, are all groups of oaks that are found in North America. And of those, the leucobalanus and erythrobalanus occur in the upper Midwest. These are the white oaks and the red oaks, the two tribes that I talked about earlier. So how did it come to pass? Well, a few years ago, I would have shown you this slide and, and said that uh, oaks had their origin uh, in, the, in the tropics of Southeast Asia. But it's important for all of us to remember that science is forever debunking the past. Uh, every new scientific discovery puts the lie to what we thought we knew. So I'm going to take this slide right out of here and say, that's not what we think anymore. And it's new news. Just published in 2019, um, Andrew Hip from the Morton Arboretum in Lyle, together with a couple of other of his uh, cohorts in genetics, um, discovered that oaks had their origin uh, more likely in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, whether that occurred in North America or in Eurasia, we don't necessarily know. Uh, but according to their findings, the earliest incontrovertible evidence of oak pollen occurs in the, um, in the fossil record going back about 56 million years ago and that was uh, discovered in uh, Austria, near Salzburg. So this is a slightly different view of oak evolution. Uh, it was, the work that uh, Andrew and his uh, colleagues uh, did was expanded upon in a recent article in Scientific American, which just came out in August of this year. So this is, this is brand new stuff, and it's kind of exciting for those of us who love oaks because we're finding more about the early, early history and uh, these illustrations um, and uh, the sidebar uh, were taken directly from the Scientific American article. Uh, and basically what it's telling us here is that in North America, um, the oaks diversified uh, through expanding their range on either side of the Rocky Mountains. So the Western species, uh, the California oaks, uh, are different genetically from those that developed in the Midwest. And those in the Midwest diversified further, again, the, uh, the, the leucobalanus and, and uh, uh, erythrobalanus groups, uh, and they diversified further as uh, the oaks expanded the range into Mexico, Central America, and on in South America. Uh, and again, land bridges, uh, whether across the Bering Straits or across the, the North Atlantic, allowed for the transfer uh, and migration of these species over time. So I'm not going to dwell on that. That's a lot of uh, scientific background, but you can dig into it if you're curious. Um, in terms of taxonomy, how we categorize uh, oak species, uh, here's the quick breakdown of the hierarchy, uh, all part of the plant kingdom, the vascular plants, that is the plants that, that uh, transmit uh, fluids uh, you know, through cellular structures from one part of the plant to the other. Uh, there are seed plants, uh, flowering plants, and uh, what you may or may not know is that they are members of the beech family, the Phagaceae, and uh, all oaks belong to the genus Quercus. So that's a little bit of background of who the oaks are or where they came from. 
let's move into uh, an exploration of the relationship between oaks and humans throughout history. So I'll start by introducing the word Balano culture. And if you're not familiar with it, it is simply the um, human use of oaks for sustenance. Uh, oaks actually have contributed to the dietary needs of human beings for millennia. Uh, we don't think of acorns as food stuff today. Uh, you don't go into Whole Foods and, and um, put a scoop into the acorn bucket and uh, you know, weigh out a, a pound to bring home. Uh, but oaks, uh, acorns are actually quite nutritious. Uh, the reason we typically don't eat them today is their bitter flavor. And that's a result of the tannins that build up in, uh, in the acorn. Um, however, um, certain species of oaks are more palatable than others. Uh, and many of the early indigenous cultures in what is now California uh, were known to subsist uh, on acorn based foods. And they could reduce the, the amount of tannins in the acorns by leaching them, uh, by boiling them, or by putting them in mesh bags and leaving them in a stream to, uh, to, to be rinsed over time, then dried, typically pulverized, pounded into a, a, a flour-like meal that could then be used you know, for cooking. Uh, so it is presumed that uh, acorns were very much uh, a part of early human diet and assisted in the development of uh, the human species throughout the temperate world. So the following group of uh, slides will feature a number of photographs of uh, um, local oaks. Um, most of the photography in this presentation is, is my own, uh, except where credit is given elsewhere. Um, but I wanted to share with you this quotation from William Bryant Logan. Uh, he was the author of the book, Oak, The Frame of Civilization. And if you haven't read that book, uh, it's, uh, it's a delightful read and I think you'd thoroughly enjoy it. Logan, again, is the author's name the frame, oak, the frame of civilization. And he says here that forests seem permanent and natural. And in fact, few are. And he says for at least 6,000 years, men and women have shaped the woods. And yes, forestry has been a, a longstanding uh, occupation uh, of human beings. No doubt the interrelationship between the woods its structure, its composition, and the human population um, has been going on for much longer than 6,000 years. Um, but again, as, as Logan notes, uh, it has been active uh, and concentrated during that period. Uh, important um, groups of people that uh, you know, have a close affinity with oaks include the, the Celts uh, and the, the Druidic practices of those early times. And I was fascinated to learn that the Celtic name for the oak derives from a Sanskrit source. But again, you know, um, these Indo-European languages are closely related. Um, but it's fascinating to note that um, the source of the word is the word for door. And I would note that uh, the, the Druids were shaman and in shamanic practice, uh, it's often um, a hollow tree that is used as a portal to the underworld in shamanic journeys. So that association between oak and door may not be as far-fetched as it may seem. And that uh, photo, by the way, is a, a beautiful specimen of a hybrid oak uh, between um, black oak and hills oak. And you'll excuse me, I've got a couple of participants who are trying to enter the um, waiting room. So let me see if I can bring them in. All right, thank you for waiting. 
So continuing the uh, Celtic view of the oaks, um, they associated the oak with what was the seventh month on their calendar, uh, roughly coinciding with uh, uh, middle of June to early July in our modern calendar. Um, a lot of other associates as well. Um, the bird they associated with the oak was the wren, um, the colors of black and brown, uh, gemstones of white carnelian and moonstone. They affiliated the oak with the summer solstice as opposed to the holly uh, of winter. So the oak king and the holly king would do battle every year and thus, depending on which one won, it would change the seasons. Uh, thunder and lightning uh, affiliated with oaks. And there's a scientific basis for that as well. Uh, as it happens, the deeply furrowed bark of oaks uh, create rivulets uh, of dry areas and wet areas uh, and that um, can create uh, an electron uh, exchange and ionic uh, effect uh, that actually can attract lightning. Uh, acorns as a symbol of fertility, uh, the element that the Druids associated with oaks was that of fire, ruled by the sun. And again, modern science connects that because as we noted, uh, oaks require abundant sunlight in order for the acorns to be able to sprout and uh, uh, become established as seedlings. So I'll come back to another quote from Bill Logan. Between the 4th and the 18th centuries in the north of Europe, 95% of all buildings were made of oak. That's an astounding figure across you know, so many centuries, such a high percentage of uh, building structures composed of oak. And oak is, is uh, relatively easy to work with. Uh, it's, uh, it can be straight and true, and it's extremely durable. Again, oak being affiliated with the image of strength. But I would also say generosity. Um, there are many ways in which oaks have supplied human beings um, over the centuries. As we talked about Balano culture, uh, sustenance through the acorns, um, structures, the buildings that we talked about, uh, and uh, causeways and, and roads. Um, plank roads were common here in the Midwest uh, as a means to cross um, wetland areas. Uh, and knowing that white oaks were uh, so water resistant and rot resistant, uh, they were often used uh, to uh, pave these roads. Uh, Vikings very early on were using oak to build their longboats and later sailors built carracks, caravels, um, three very famous caravels, the Nina, the Pinta and the Santa Maria. Um, again, caravels carrying ocean travelers barrels. Uh, and again, um, Cooper's work was uh, uh, significantly dependent on oaks, uh, especially the white oak, Quercus alba. Um, the cellular structure in the heartwood is such that uh, not only does it split evenly for e relatively easy joining, uh, it also uh, is extremely water resistant and uh, could therefore be used for casks and barrels to contain liquids. Oaks were used in tanning leather. Uh, I mentioned the presence of tannic acid in the acorns, giving them the bitter uh, quality of the flavor. Uh, tannins are abundantly found throughout uh, oak tissue structures uh, in the inner bark, in the leaves, uh, and in the acorns. And uh, that and we'll talk about that when we talk about fire. Uh, indelible inks were derived from certain oak galls in Europe. Um, the Magna Carta was written uh, in permanent ink derived from oak galls. So another little, uh, little assemblage of facts uh, from William Bryant Logan. Uh, a single acre of oak woods 
can take two tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. And we talk about the need for carbon sequestration today. This is huge, two tons of carbon for one acre of woods. And in so doing, these trees are uh, contributing um, about nine cords of, of wood. Uh, and when you're looking at burning firewood, that's the equivalent of 234,000 BTUs. And long before human beings were measuring heat in British thermal units, they recognized that oak firewood um, burned hotter and longer, provided more heat uh, for a longer period of time than most any other tree species. So oaks have been our friends throughout history. But now let's shift and take a look at, at how many species and what species occur here in the upper Midwest and specifically in this region around Walworth County, Wisconsin, um, southeastern Wisconsin and, and northeastern Illinois. Uh, the white oak, Quercus rubra, swamp white oak, Quercus bicolor, hills oak, Quercus ellipsoidalis, and distinguishing species between oaks can be challenging. As I mentioned, they hybridize. Um, very often you find specimens that exhibit uh, taxonomic traits uh, that are intermediate between two or more species. Uh, up until fairly recently, there was some question with regard to uh, which between the hills oak Quercus ellipsoidalis and scarlet oak, Quercus hypocinia, which of those species was present or predominant here in this region? Again, Andrew Hip from the Morton Arboretum through his work in genetics uh, has established uh, that locally here in uh, Wisconsin, it's almost certainly Quercus ellipsoidalis. And the northernmost extent of the scarlet oak is probably southern Cook County, Illinois. So we'll call it Hills Oak, Quercus ellipsoidalis. Uh, shingle Oak, Quercus imbricaria. Burr Oak, Quercus macrocarpa. Chinkapin, Quercus muhlenbergii. Pin Oak, Quercus palustris. Red Oak, Quercus rubra. And Black Oak, Quercus glutina. So these are the species that occur in the region. But again, I mentioned the hybridization issue, and this confuses matters considerably. So for the serious field botanist or taxonomist, you'll note that white and burr oak hybridize, that white and swamp white hybridize, that swamp white and burr hybridize, and that, excuse me, I'm letting someone else into the meeting, and that burr and chinkapin also hybridize. So in addition to the um, true species in the white oak tribe, we've got four named hybrids. And these occur with sufficient frequency that botanists have been able to, as you see, name them. So the, the hybrid between white oak and Fir oak, for example, is called Bebs oak, Quercus ex Bebiana. Now it gets even worse in the red oak tribe. So hang on to your hats. You can get hills oak uh, combining with black oak. You can get red and black oak hybridizing. Black oak and pin oak. Black oak and shingle oak. Red oak and pin oak. Red oak and shingle oak, and pin oak and shingle oak. So once again, um, these occur with sufficient regularity that the hybrids can be identified by name. We call, for example, the, the hybrid between um, hills oak and black oak, uh, Quercus ex paleolithicola. You won't be quizzed on this. So let's narrow it down to just those common local species. Which are the species that you're really likely to see in the Kettle Moraine region, in Walworth County, for example? 
We'll see white oak, Quercus alba. Hills oak, as I mentioned, Quercus ellipsoidalis. This also has another common name locally. Uh, a lot of folks in Wisconsin refer to this as northern pin oak. Um, I tend not to use that name so as not to confuse it with Quercus palustris pin oak. So Hills oak named for the botanist E.J. Hill. Burr oak, Quercus macrocarpa, whom you see here illustrated in the photo. And then red oak, Quercus rubra. It's really just these four that we're likely to encounter, hybrids notwithstanding. But let's take a look at how these species sort themselves out on the landscape. Why do we have four different species of oak and not just one? Uh, how is it that they differ from one another? What ecological niches might they occupy? Um, and again, what are their so-called preferences? So here's a, uh, an interesting map we'll spend just a, a couple of minutes on. Um, you see that's labeled Bigfoot Woods. Uh, this is just south of the state line, uh, below Lake Geneva, below Walworth on uh, uh, US Route 14. Um, and again, just, just the other side of the state line in Henry County uh, near the community of Bigfoot. Uh, and what's fascinating about this, this oak woods, this plot, is that apparently it escaped complete uh, cutover at the time of uh, settlement by uh, the European uh, pioneers who came here. Uh, in other words, there are a number of tree specimens here that are older than um, 200 years old. These we refer to as pre-settlement age. So the circles represent individual trees. Uh, the brown ones are, are burr, uh, the uh, red ones are red, uh, those shown in pink, um, while noted here as scarlet, uh, are what I would call hills oak. And again, this, this work goes back a few, uh, a few years, I think 10 years ago, when we were still not sure if we had scarlet or hills. Uh, and then the white circles represent white oaks. Uh, and then the squares, the blocks, indicate uh, the younger cohort of trees, those that um, have ar arisen uh, after the, the 1830s. So uh, oaks that are typically 150 years or, or, or younger. And there, you know, we see um, that the distribution has shifted a little bit and reproductive success has shifted. You don't see many blocks, uh, many squares of white. The white oaks are not reproducing as well in the post agricultural era. Um, whereas the um, hills oaks uh, are expanding their range, uh, somewhat also the red oaks. But I also want you to note that these groupings of species um, are spacing themselves out on the landscape. And they're doing so according to um, the hydrology in site. The um, burr oaks are occupying lower elevations that are moister. The white oaks are occupying uh, areas that are better drained. The red oaks are occupying areas that are a little more uh, densely shaded. Um, so we start to see some of the so-called preferences of these various species. Okay, another way of looking at their um, reproductive success over time um, the blue bars indicate the older specimens. The red bars indicate the, the younger ones, those you know, in the post-agricultural uh, period, uh, the last 100, 150 years. So the white oak and burr oak were dominant in terms of basal density, that is to say the amount of woody tissue per area um, in the pre-settlement period. So whites and burrs were common on this parcel. Since then, red and hills have, uh, have uh, been more successful uh, at reproducing. Uh, hills, very markedly so, 
they were not as common uh, in an earlier time, but they seem to be thriving uh, more so than other oaks in the modern era. And it's worth noting that the red and the hills, they're both members of the red oak tribe, they're acorns that have a higher tannin content than uh, the white oak tribe. And this is because the acorns in white oaks ripen uh, within one growing season. They're pollinated in the spring, the acorns develop and mature before the ensuing winter. With the red oak tribe, pollination occurs in the early spring and the acorns remain in a small dormant state, continuing to grow uh, through that growing season, through the winter, into the next growing season, and they do not ripen into mature acorns until a year and a half to two years after pollination occurs. This means that they accumulate a higher concentration of tannic acid. It makes the red oak acorns more bitter than the white oak acorns. And that may have something to do with um, mammal predation on acorns, seed consumption, as opposed to uh, seed distribution. So we know that animals eat acorns, and that will be our segue into looking at the ecological aspects of our oaks. Lots of animals eat acorns. It's a big nut, uh, relatively speaking, and highly nutritious. Uh, there's a lot of food energy stored in an acorn. And this is how it is that uh, these mighty trees can grow from these, these nuts. Um, a lot of energy is put into uh, establishing a root system. When oaks first sprout from the acorn, they send down a leader, uh, a root, and they continue to tap uh, from that stored energy in the acorn as the root gets established uh, for a period of a couple of years uh, before the above ground portion of the oak seedling um, begins to mature. So I won't read through the list. You can read them for yourself. A lot of mammals, a lot of birds eat acorns. A lot of insects also feed on oaks, typically on the leaves. Um, but looking at the vast variety of uh, insects that do, uh, it's pretty significant. And we'll explore some of that in greater detail here in just a little bit. Um, but every group of insects has their own way of feeding on it. Mostly, for the most part, it's, it's uh, the leaves that are fed upon, uh, and very often by uh, insect larvae early in the spring before those leaves have, uh, have uh, a year's worth of growth to accumulate more tannins. And again, you can take a look at this. There are, leaf, or there are insects that burrow under the bark. Uh, there are insects that lay their eggs in the canopy. Uh, there are leaf miners. There are uh, insect or leaf chewers, et cetera. But I want to take a look at one particular local insect that's not as common now as it used to be, but it's still, it's still present here in our woods. Uh, stick insects, the, the uh, walking stick locally. Um, these insects feed on oak and cherry leaves. And when the females are ready to release their eggs, they climb high into the canopy. And they simply allow the eggs to drop down uh, through the leaves and branches, fall to the ground, and there they may overwinter in the leaf litter, or more commonly, they're discovered by ants. And ants will cart these eggs off to their nests because there's a small appendage on the egg. It's called a capitula. And ants find these very uh, attractive. Um, it's a, a fatty, nutritious uh, substance. So the ants will either consume the capitulum or, or shave it off the egg and feed it to their larva, depends on species. But they, don't, they have no interest in the egg itself. They're only after the capitulum. So once they've taken that, they just toss the egg into a, a midden, uh, a, a little dump within their, uh, their nest. 
Uh, and that really becomes uh, something of an incubator for, for these eggs. And uh, they're protected from, uh, from fire or from predators uh, while nestled in the ant nest and uh, are free then to emerge as larvae and uh, thereafter metamorph into adult walking sticks. I mentioned oak galls earlier when talking about indelible inks. Um, galls are formed by various insect species, typically when they lay their eggs in a twig or um, leaf tissue. Uh, and when they deposit the egg, they also deposit an enzyme that reacts with the, um, with the plant tissue uh, and forms a, a, a gall. Uh, this is a, a abnormal growth uh, of the plant tissue in response to the chemical compounds and enzymes uh, deposited by the insect. So notably, there are a variety of species of wasps that produce uh, oak galls. Uh, here's one of our more visible ones. These can get to be, oh, nearly as large as a ping pong ball. Uh, and you'll often see them, you know, later in the summer uh, in oak woods. And if you ever have an opportunity to find one, they're, they're hollow, they're fairly soft, they're easy to cut through. Cut one open, it's got this incredible starburst uh, structure on the inside. And again, this is the result of uh, uh, the apple gall wasp. All right, um, famously, butterflies and moths make tremendous use of, uh, of our oaks, um, very often laying their eggs uh, on twigs uh, and then the uh, larva emerging to feed on the young leaves. Uh, it has been uh, noted that there are uh, hundreds of species uh, that do so. And a couple of uh, iconic local butterfly species, the hair streaks, um, Edwards hair streak, banded hair streak. There are several other hair streak species. Um, these are small butterflies about the size of a quarter um, and uh, wholly dependent upon oaks for their survival. And as has been uh, documented by Doug Tallamy, um, near and dear to wild ones uh, throughout the country, uh, there's no other group of, of species other than the oaks that support the sheer number of butterfly and wasp species, or butterfly and moth species. Uh, he's documented 534 species of Lepidoptera uh, dependent on oaks. And as I mentioned earlier, most of these um, lay their eggs on the twigs. Um, those eggs hatch er, uh, late in April, early in May, and the larvae emerge just around the same time that the oak leaves are beginning to unfurl. Uh, the oak leaves are highly palatable at that time. They have not built up uh, a lot of uh, tannic acid. So the larvae are free to munch on these uh, um, soft, young, tender leaves just at the time that migratory songbirds uh, are are coming back uh, to the, their northern climes uh, in, the, in the spring migration. So these larvae are feeding the insects or the, uh, the birds that have just come back from their long journey. And then as the spring continues and the birds begin to uh, care for their brood, uh, they're very often feeding um, insect larvae to the young. Um, bird feeders full of seeds are great, but uh, especially in the spring, uh, most of these bird species need the protein inherent in insects to be able to feed their young and enable them to flourish. So that brings us back around to uh, acorns and, and uh, birds. Um, you may be surprised to learn that uh, blue jays are major dispersers of acorns. Uh, they consume the acorns to be sure, but they also cache them uh, as do squirrels. And it's fascinating that uh, a blue jay can carry as many as five acorns at one time, uh, three of which they can store in their throat while in flight, um, one in the mouth and one in the open beak, as you see here in the photograph. And as I mentioned, they share 
with squirrels, the uh, capacity to cache acorns in shallow um, soil depressions. Some of these get forgotten, and uh, some of those may, in fact, turn into oak trees someday. So I want to do a quick assessment of the health of our oak populations um, in the time that remains. And um, I see that we are getting on toward the 11 o'clock hour. So I'll, I'll go through the rest of these slides fairly quickly. Um, but one thing I want to note is that when you look at the woods, you may see trees of various size. You may see some fairly large, older oaks with broad crowns, and you may see a number of somewhat smaller uh, oaks. Um, and you may assume that, okay, these have uh, grown up at uh, various times. They, they sprouted at different times, uh, and that reproduction has been continuous. Uh, and the truth of the matter is it didn't happen that way. Um, the oaks in, in today's populations tend to sort themselves out pretty neatly into two or maybe three cohorts. Um, that is to say, a group of oaks that, um, that were established at about the same time in history. Uh, we see our older cohort being that that, are, uh, that occurred just around the time that uh, European settlers uh, overran the area. Um, they put a stop to the fires that the Native Americans had routinely set. Uh, and this enabled uh, oak grubs uh, to um, sprout rapidly from, from, uh, from their rootstocks. At the same time, the settlers cut down most of the mature trees. So you have a cohort uh, that, that uh, came out of, uh, of the ground, so to speak, uh, right around 1840, 1850. And then you have another cohort uh, that came in after changes in agricultural practices closer to the beginning of the 20th century. And what I want to point out here, if you look at the, the fourth bullet point, um, trees of the same age may differ dramatically uh, in terms of, of size. Uh, you can have a 20 inch diameter oak uh, growing in the same station with a 10 inch diameter oak and they may be exactly the same age. Just like people, we're not all built the same size. So oaks are reproducing in some areas, in some locations, but it's not consistent and it's probably not adequate to replace the aging populations that we have. Many of the oldest cohort of oaks that we have now are reaching um, you know, the end of their lifespan. A um, couple of hundred years is a long time for most organisms. And while oaks can live hundreds of years longer than that, it's not common. Um, and in a lot of our, our restored savannas, restored woodlands, we are not getting the oak recruitment that we expected. And that's significant. We assumed that if we opened up the canopy and brought in the sunlight, that the oaks would reproduce on their own. That there are acorns being, being produced, they are sprouting, uh, they're putting down their, their taproot to get started, uh, but very few are making it to adult size. And there's something going on. We know that oak reproduction is episodic, but we don't know all the factors that are contributing to that. The key thing is oaks are not reproducing in numbers sufficient to replace those we are losing and opening up uh, the areas to more sunlight is not sufficient to stimulate that reproduction. So there are a variety of other threats to our oaks. Um, you know, the aging population hindered reproduction, you know, certainly, as we just talked about. We are losing oak habitat. Uh, we are building uh, uh, and, and we're taking down oaks. Um, we are doing harm to oaks by our building practices that may impact their root systems, uh, soil compaction, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, and we are seeing a variety of pathogens that are taking a toll on our oaks. The photo is a, a, <clears throat> a red oak that has succumbed to oak blight at Peterson Island Woods, uh, it's oak wilt. Oak wilt tends to affect the red oak tribe Burr oak blight tends to affect burr oaks. 
Uh, gypsy moth is a, an invasive insect species that uh, can defoliate uh, oak trees. But one of the threats that I want to bring up very quickly because it's dramatic and it's fresh is that of extreme weather. And we have seen extreme weather events in this region. Um, and we've got some beautiful old oaks uh, that are at risk because of that. You know, here's a photo of what we call the Banford Oak. It's on Banford Road in Woodstock, Illinois, not far from where I live. And if you take a close look at that photograph, there is a bench here uh, behind the oak. That kind of gives you a sense of scale, just how large this, this uh, oak trunk is. And uh, they actually built this park around this oak because it was so iconic. Uh, I took this photo in, in March of this year during one of my early pandemic walks. And uh, here it is, a photo I took in September. It's down. A derecho uh, blew through Northern Illinois on August 10th of this year. And it knocked down what was a healthy mature tree. Sad loss. But we do have healthy mature trees. Uh, the discovery of the Gateway Oak in Harvard, Illinois. This is just off uh, US Route 14 and uh, Illinois Route 23. An immense white oak. And, and white oaks tend to grow more slowly than others. They don't attain the same size as say bur oaks as readily. Um, take a look at those low lateral branches. There are half a dozen branches on that tree just above head height each of which is the size of a mature oak unto itself. Immense. It was estimated that this tree may be 400 years old. 400 years ago was the year 1620. That was the year that the Mayflower brought the pilgrims to Plymouth. Hard to imagine an organism that old here in our own backyard. But again, I visited this site in August after the Duresho. She's gone. And you can see from the brown leaves, she was in full leaf and knocked down. These were healthy trees. So the storm damage doesn't necessarily kill the trees outright. You know, here is a red oak um, from Pleasant Valley in uh, McHenry County. Uh, it's an oak from which we collected acorns. It's a mast tree. It, it often produces an abundance of acorns each year. So uh, we, we find it easy to get out there on this little trail and collect the, uh, the, the acorns that fall. But it's lost a huge branch that, uh, you know, was responsible for producing a lot of those acorns that we've used in our reforestation and, and tree planting efforts. But there are young trees coming up. There are sapling oaks. There are young adult trees. They're out there and they need our protection. They need our care. On the left, um, this is a hills oak. And on the right, a, a bur oak. Uh, again, photos taken just earlier this month uh, at a couple of different locations. We can help to foster the next generation. So what we're finding with regard to oak reproduction is that um, fire is not a significant inhibitor. Uh, it, it, uh, it may restrict growth, but it typically doesn't outright kill uh, the seedlings. Um, we know that weevils infest the acorns. Um, but we found that that is not a particular deterrent either. Uh, an acorn is large enough that it can host two or three weevils and still sprout and still grow. Um, what we are finding is acorn predation is significant uh, and that there are certain species that seem to be most um, guilty of consuming a lot of acorns. Mice and voles 
are among the most voracious of our acorn predators. And they tend to feed upon acorns in open savannas, such as we've been trying to replicate and we've been trying to restore. They don't predominate in the brushy woods, although brushy woods have their own challenges with regard to sunlight. So what else? What I just said about the, the mice and voles, um, they don't like the tall herbaceous vegetation that we associate with a, a healthy restored, um, I'm sorry, they, they, they do tend to feed in those areas with the tall herbaceous vegetation, whereas squirrels do not. And squirrels are more likely to cache acorns in a manner that uh, enables uh, reproduction. You know, when the, the mice collect acorns, they put them all in one cache in their winter nest and they consume them all. With the squirrels, they scatter them here and there, they forget where they planted them and they end up sprouting. So what, we, what can we do to assure that we have a future with oaks? Um, we know that the competition for resources is significant, that there are invasive species and other aggressive native species, uh, mesophytic tree species that are competing with, with, uh, with our, our oaks. So we need to remove them from, from the remnant oak uh, stands to the extent that we can. We know that there's loss of habitat, so we need to restore suitable habitat. We know that recruitment of young oaks has not been adequate to replace the aging um, specimens. So it's important that we plant and nurture oaks. And that's just what we do in a lot of, uh, a lot of our efforts. You know, um, photo on the left, a uh, tree planting expedition with one of the weekends of restoration uh, through the McHenry County Conservation District. Photo on the right depicts um, crew members of the Youth Conservation Corps uh, working on assembling cages to protect newly planted oaks from deer browse. Um, on the left, you see a, uh, a sapling oak at Peterson Island Woods, uh, where it has been caged, again, to protect it from browse. And on the right, you see a beautiful little hills oak with its uh, reddish leaves emerging in the spring little saplings. And I'm just going to close out with a few photos of some of our local oaks and, and oak uh, woods. Uh, this is the oak woodland at Army Lake, uh, the newly constructed uh, public access site. Uh, behind the fencing is a wonderful oak woodland with a rich ground layer. Here you see a couple of young oaks at Bald Bluff uh, in the uh, Kettle Moraine State Forest. Uh, on the left is a hills oak, on the right is a bur oak. And you see that as a theme. The hills oak and the bur oak seem to be reproducing uh, a little bit better than the, the white oaks. And then here's some autumn oaks at our Beulah Bluff Preserve. Again, a photo taken just a, a week or two ago. And I'm bringing you around to another quotation from our friend Doug Tallamy. The value of oaks for supporting both vertebrate and invertebrate wildlife cannot be overstated. That's a really significant statement coming from a scientist. The value of oaks for supporting wildlife cannot be overstated. That's huge. So I just want to thank uh, some of the people and, and uh, organizations that have contributed content to this. Again, Andrew Hipp at the Arboretum, Tom Simpson at MCCD, Doug Tallamy, William Bryant Logan, pick up his book, Oak, the Friend of Civilization. The Chicago Regional Trees Initiative is an organization uh, that is uh, uh, head headlining the uh, Oak Ecosystem uh, Recovery Plan and the Oak Ecosystem Working Group, uh, doing good work uh, throughout the region. So I want to thank you all. Uh, it's been a wonderful morning, <sighs> spending time with my Wild Ones friends and with my Oak friends.
So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and welcome all of you back. Um, I, I'd like to just mention that there are no questions in the chat. So if anyone else has a question right now, please uh, uh, unmute yourself if you're muted and, and um, ask your question. <laughs> 